Watch out, Jimmy. All right, all right, everybody. Jeremiah chapter 24 tonight. Love seeing a, such a good crowd coming back out for the midweek service. That does my heart good. I love... Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you love God's Word? You find yourself loving it more and more. You know, the more you, dang, what do you, I don't know what y'all got going on. <laughs> y'all run everybody away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord, we're going to have to have a special prayer meeting tonight. Oh, my goodness. Hey, we, we may have to go outside tonight. We may have to have church outside tonight. I'm worried about the roof. I ain't going to tell, hey, good me. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. Guys, I want to encourage you. You gotta. We got other states like Arkansas and North Carolina that need the gospel. They need the gospel. There, there's a lot of heathens over there. Yeah, Josh has got me. He's got me keyed up. All right, Jeremiah chapter 24. One of the things we keep learning through the book of Jeremiah is that God has given clear warnings of what He is going to do if you continue to disobey. And I want you to see as we've been going through there that God is. In him, in him, an amazing, merciful God. When I think of the compassion and the mercy and His grace, every day I, I say, "Lord, I don't, I don't know why You're so forgiving and so uh, merciful toward me." You know, and but we see this in the Book of Jeremiah. I mean, all these years, hundreds of years, the Jewish people, as uh, God told Moses, they're stiff-necked. Remember that stiff-necked. You know, they're stuck. And one of the things that I was that I've, it's really been heavy on my heart and I was stressing to you guys Sunday morning is I want you to go back and I want you to really remember the time that, that uh, when you were saved, the time when, when God called you out of darkness. Remember I said Sunday morning, He took you out of the kingdom of darkness and He placed you into the kingdom of His Son. What an amazing thing by His grace. It, it wasn't because of anything you did. You know, He just did that. And here you are, this child of God that belongs to Him. And you're eternally secure in Him. And sometimes we need to go back and we need to remember what happened to us. And as I told him Sunday morning, it's Christianity 101 that what happened when He did that for you is you, you, you died. The old you died. The old man died. Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. Remember, we get into Romans, we understand Romans 6. I died. I don't live anymore. Galatians 2, I don't live anymore, but Christ liveth in me. John 15, right? You are the, you are the, uh, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I can go on and on of what happened to you. He placed you into this body, a living body of people. And you look around the room, we're all here in this vapor of a life, and we're just waiting to meet our Lord, aren't we? But we've got work to do while we're here. While it's still light, the Bible tells us in John, we work while it's still light. Because it won't be long. And we've been learning about what's coming. Well, I want you guys to really constantly keep thinking, not what am I doing in my little vapor of a life for self, but what am I doing in this vapor of a life for the kingdom of God? How am I serving? Like I said Sunday morning, if you're a part of the body, if you're a foot, and, and, and we have to take your foot off, you're not going to walk around too good, right? The body can't function properly if everybody's not doing their part. So as you become a Christian, one of the first things you start learning to do is what is my part in the body? How do I serve the body? You know, And there's a variety of parts, a variety of roles in the body of Christ. And everybody is gifted for some role. Okay, Some of you have a gift and you can perform many roles in the body of Christ. Some people are gifted for just one specific role. But it's not a competition in the church, is it? What do I tell you often? There's no rank. I'm not ranked over you because I'm the speaker. I'm the teacher. We're all equal. 
There's no male or female in God's eyes, right? We're all one in Christ. But we have unique, role, unique roles, unique gifting. And you'll find that out as, uh, as you get married and, get, and start a family. There's a, a role for the husband, a role for the wife, just like in the church, just like in the workplace. So God has been teaching us through Jeremiah his patience and his mercy. He keeps telling them, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, Babylon's about to take you over. But even in the midst of his judgment, we're still going to see his grace and mercy. And we'll see that tonight. Tonight's ten verses. Ten verses. So I hope you got some questions because I'm going to knock this out pretty quick and, uh, and we'll get some questions and we'll go eat supper. How's that sound? All right, look at verse... Um, before we get started, Pat, put up, put up there Jeremiah 21.8. I'm going to take you back a couple of chapters for a little introduction so that you remember what's happening here. In, verse, in chapter 21, verse 8, he said, You shall also say to this people, thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who dwells in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and falls away to the Chaldeans who are besieging you will live and he will have his own life as booty. For I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. So the choice that God gave them there, life and death, if you go on out and accept your, your judgment, accept the consequences of your sin, of your idol worship, your rebellion, all these years, if you will go on out and accept your punishment, then I'm going to spare your life. But if you choose to wait back, really what they were doing, hoping the gods of Baal, or maybe the king of e you know, the Egypt, uh, their armies would come up and defend them, counting on something else other than God to get you through, then I'm going to destroy you. And isn't that a lesson for us still today? You can't count. Uh, a man told me today, he, you know, he's needing some help, and he said, I've learned one thing. I can't do this on my own. I need help. I said, but, <laughs> hey, big smiles right there, because when you get there, that's when you're getting somewhere. And I don't care if it's addiction, marital trouble, troubles at work, health issues, whatever it is. When you get there and you say, Lord, I need help. I can't do this on my own. What kind of God is he? Remember what he said in John? What father, if his son asked for bread, would he give him a stone? No, God wants to bless you. He wants to help you. He wants to comforts you and guides you but he wants this close relationship with you but he'll also punish you right he, he disciplines those whom he loves so there's the the little intro i wanted to give you so now here it comes verse one here comes nebuchadnezzar babylon's coming and he says after nebuchadnezzar king of babylon had carried away captive jeconiah the son of jehoiakim okay remember he's the second to the last king he, he doesn't serve very long three months uh he's a wicked king so after he has been carried, after he's been uh, carried away captive, Jeconiah, I'm sorry, Jeconiah gets carried away. Um, Zedekiah is the last king. Jeconiah is the one before him. If I'm confusing you, I told you in the beginning. Don't try to memorize all these kings. Okay, you're just going to get lost. And uh, and I, here I am leading you into doing that. Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the officials of Judah, with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. The Lord showed me. Behold, two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. Now, all I want you to remember from this first verse is this is 597 B.C. When you look at the what we call the deportations, when Babylon came into Jerusalem and took over, they did it in three waves or three different times. Okay, 605, 597, and 586 B.C. was the last one. 605, we read when we went through the book of Daniel, that's when Daniel and all the sons of the the higher officials there were taken captive okay this is the second captivity this is you know so from five uh 605 to 597 this is the jeconiah that he's taken here that that uh, nebuchadnezzar takes he is the last of the kings that are in david's line all right the last of the kings that's in david's line that should be triggering something in your minds if it doesn't I'll answer it in a few minutes but you should be triggered why is that important about David's line okay we know that Jesus will be the next king to sit on the throne of David 
And he will do that in the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. But God's going to use another object lesson we see here. This time, he says it's two baskets of figs. He set beside him, in front of him, two baskets of figs at the temple of the Lord. Verse 2, one basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs. And the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten due to rottenness. Now, we don't know whether the Lord showed him literally this or if it was a vision. It doesn't tell us there, so we won't speculate. But all we know is that Jeremiah says the Lord showed him these two baskets. Uh, it's the lesson that matters. Verse 3, Then the Lord said to me, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the bad figs, very bad, which cannot be eaten Due to rottenness. Has anybody got a King James Bible here? What does yours say there in that verse? Have you got it open? Verse 3. No, that's right. But yours is not a King James. Is she getting there... Yeah, evil. Some translations say naughty. Have y'all ever seen, heard of that? Naughty. I mean, so I, I just that was one for my wife. She enjoyed learning that. But uh, but very obviously we know that some of the figs were good, and some of the figs in the other basket were rotten. Okay. We also see Jesus use a fig tree as a lesson in the New Testament. Did y'all's mind go there? And I thought, I, let's look at it. Matthew twenty one eighteen. Now, so you got to remember, uh, here's Jesus. He had just cleansed the temple. Y'all remember the story. He goes in. These people would come in with a dove or a lamb that they had bought all the way to Jerusalem to sacrifice. And they get up there, and the crooked, the wicked priests that were there would say, that, that dove's no good, or that lamb's no good. you got to buy ours. So instead of buying a, and I'm just going to make up a number here, instead of buying a lamb for $5, they'd make you buy their lamb for $500. So they were robbing the people, okay? Extortion. You know, it was just, and so that's why Jesus turned over the tables. But to be clear, Jesus didn't sin. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of robbers. He turned over the tables and run out all the money changers, is what he said. I shouldn't have said the priest did that. But the money changers, that's what they were doing. They were robbing the people. So Jesus had just finished that. And then the next morning, it says, now in the morning after that, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it. Now, can you see Jesus walking up to a fig tree and talking to it? So you're following Jesus. They done seen quite a few things. In fact, just eight, 12 hours ago, probably, they saw him run out thousands of people out of the temple. Okay? He made a big scene. Now they're seeing him talk to a fig tree. And he said to it. No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. Now, you could casually read this and skip right over that. But as a good student of the Bible, you read that and, that, and you see the impact of what he's saying. It's what we're seeing here tonight in Jeremiah. Can you imagine God looking at you saying, there shall never be any fruit from you? And we Remember what we heard a few, three chapters now? Three different times in the book of Jeremiah. God even told Jeremiah, don't pray for these people. That's pretty graphic, isn't it? He said, can you imagine if God told you, don't pray for your lost family? I'm done with them. There will never be any fruit come from them. They're cut off. Can you imagine how that would hit your heart? Well, Jesus looked at this tree and he said, there shall never be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. And we know that the fig tree is used all through the Old Testament as a symbol 
of Israel. So when you look at that passage there, and you're looking, that's what he's talking about, Israel, okay? Israel had all the blessings of God, but they were fruitless. They had no fruit. They did nothing for their God. They were focused on self. Remember what we learned Sunday morning. Why would those people sit and refuse to work? And I, and I stress to you guys, I don't want you to just hear that, 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 that if you don't work, you don't eat. Even unbelievers agree with that all over the world, right? People should work for their own. But I wanted you to dig deeper and see the real spiritual impact there. you got people in the church that are saying, I don't care about the rest of the church. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't want to work anymore. And I'm expecting you to take care of me. See where their heart was. God always looks upon the heart. We learned that in Samuel, didn't we? With, with David and Saul, the whole story there. God looks upon the heart. You can't lie to God. He knows your heart. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus said, it's not what goes in the man that defiles him, right? It's what comes out. And what comes out of a, when will we learned in Jeremiah, the heart is what? It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's the nature. That's all people's nature. That's why we stress to you here and we teach in this church that you cannot start a gospel conversation without warning people that the wrath of God is upon them because of their sin. And they need to understand the total depravity, their, their nature. You have a sinful nature. You, that's who you are. You know, I used to hear when I was growing up, you're not a sinner because you sinned. You sin because you're a sinner. That's who you are. Romans 5, you inherited the sin from your father Adam. But these people, uh, Israel, for thousands of years now, they've done nothing for their God. So God is making it here through the story Jesus is showing. I'm making it where you can't do anything. Jesus is giving a, before it actually happened, he's given them a precursor of what's fixing to happen. And what did he do to the nation of Israel? He cut them off. Remember Romans 11? He cut them off. And he did what? He brought the Gentiles in. And the Jewish people today, 2,000 years later, are still cut off. They're still blinded. They do not see Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But after the, at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation, after the rapture of the church and the three and a half years, at that point is when Zechariah's prophe prophecy is coming true. And he says, I will pour out upon the house of David, the Jewish people, the spirit of supplication, the spirit, and they will look on me whom they pierced, and they will weep bitterly as one, we as one mourns for an only son. So God is going to restore the Jewish people. And we're going to see a little glimpse of that right here uh, in the next few verses. So these people were dead. Made me think, okay, Derek, you're talking about the Jewish people. That was a long time ago. What about me? Well, what should we see in our lives? As Christians, we should see fruit that shows that we have been changed, right? Everybody that's a Christian should be producing fruit. How do I know that? Because Jesus is producing the fruit through you. What did we all on Sunday night uh, just a while back go through studying the fruit of the spirits? Or fruit of the spirit. I'm going to put an S in there anyway. The fruit of the spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, there's going to be spiritual fruit coming forth from you. There's no way around that. There's no such thing as a non-fruit bearing Christian. We as Christians are a whole new creation. The old is past, the new has come. We died to self, and now we live for Christ. We don't walk around trying to, you know, just fulfill the lust of the flesh and to live it up and to store treasures on earth. We walk around saying, Lord, what would you have me do? Remember little Isaiah? After he saw the Lord high and lifted up, what was his, and I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. What does he say in the, in the, shortly after that? Here I am. I'll go. Send me. What else, what else have I got for me in this planet? Nothing. I just want to do what the Lord wants me to do because I'm going to be with him soon and I'm going to answer to him. We are here to serve and we will suffer for it. Now you know why I'm constantly stressing to all of you, to the church, how much, it, how important it is that you love the church. I, that's so important. What did I tell the kids Sunday at grad, after graduation? Stay close to the church. Stay close to them. You're going to need them. You're going to need the church. The world is designed to destroy you. It's got all of the little things that shine, all that glitters, and it's trying to attract you out there to pull you away. But you don't see 
the hooks that are behind the little shiny. You know, we used to use the fishing example. You know, the fishermen, it, it, the, the fish don't see that hook, right? It sees that food. It sees that shiny thing, and it just wants it. But I want you to stay close to the church, love the church. Jesus said in John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So see there, Jesus is constantly showing. Look what he's done with Israel. Now we can go back to Jeremiah. How many warnings have they been given? Remember I told you the northern kingdom's already gone. Assyria conquered them 100 years before. They should have learned from their brothers to the north, but they didn't. They still kept believing that the gods of this world could give them something that the one true God couldn't give them. And it's all a lie, wasn't it? It's all a lie. You know, and I'm, and I'm going to be honest with you. We're all, we all know how easy it is to believe the lies of Satan. I mean, I have. <laughs> I mean, there, he puts stuff right out there and makes it look so fun and so easy, and the flesh loves it. I was telling the man the other day, Satan watches. He knows what mankind loves. He studies us. He has for 6,000 plus years, right? He studied mankind. He knows what you like. When you show him what you like, you get ready. You, hey, AI started long before what you're seeing now. Verse 4, Jeremiah 24, 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I will regard as good the captives of Judah whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, for I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them again to this land. Y'all need to underline that. When you get into studying eschatology, and that's one you'll go to, this verse right here. God says, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them up and not overthrow them, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. We know that this is a near prophecy that will happen again. We see Nehemiah and Ezra and those names, they come back and they do some good things, right? But then what happens uh, in 70 AD? They're destroyed, gone again. So see, but we know what will happen when Jesus Christ returns. That remnant, when he opens their eyes, I told you about earlier, he's going to restore the Jewish people. So there's another verse you can use to help you understand. He says, I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know me. Another nugget right there, guys. And we're getting some good ones in this passage. In 10, underline that. I will give them a heart to know me. How do people know Jesus Christ? He has to give them the gift of grace. He has to open their eyes. He has to regenerate them. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Dead people don't do anything. They don't think or reason or do any of that. God says, I will give them a heart to know me. It's just like he showed Ezekiel. Go read in Ezekiel and the vision of, that he gives Ezekiel, the dry bones out there. He shows him, I'm going to put my spirit and my flesh on them. I'm going to bring them to life. They can't, dead bones can't bring themselves to life. It's what do I say often. We did with the John 3, Nicodemus is seen, you know. Nicodemus says, well, I, I can't go back into my mother again, right? And he goes, well, no. In the whole lesson there is you can't born yourself again. You can't do that. It is the Spirit that gives life. And I can watch the church. One of the benefits I get of, be, of being a preacher is I get to see the joy on faces. I get to look out and see people that I know that you remember when Jesus Christ saved you. You know that He's forgiven you of your sin. And you can hear it in certain messages. Sometimes you feel like you're getting beat up on, right? 
because you just ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing. But then there's other messages where you're reminded of that grace, that amazing grace. And boy, you start smiling. And I can see the smile on their faces. And I'm like, yeah, they, they know the Lord. You can see it in people, and I love that. And, and that's because God gave you the heart to know me, he says, for I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. Watch this. For they will return to me with their whole heart. And that's, I'm crying out just like Jeremiah, you know, was return to the Lord. Just go to him. Go to the Lord with your whole heart. Don't go to him. You can't, you can't put one foot in the world, right? Can't serve two masters. You got to give him your whole heart. And he knows when you give him your whole heart or not. He knows if you're still trying to hang on to something else. But when you say, Lord, when you have that moment with Jesus Christ, you hit your knees and say, Lord, I want to deny myself. I do believe, like the man cried out, I do believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. You know, I'm just a man. I, I'm weak. I need you, Christ. I need you to come into my heart and change me and make, and make me your disciple. I want to serve you. I want to leave. I want to forsake this world and follow you. You've got to do that. And God gives you the ability to do that. And then give him your whole heart. As I, that's why I read John 15 to you earlier. Abide in him. It's a difference to love him and to know him and to abide in him. A lot of people know Jesus. You go talk to Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, the Muslims, they love Jesus. Don't, that's what they'll tell you. Oh, yeah, we love Jesus. We know who Jesus is. But they're not abiding in him, are they? See, they, they want to cling to this and this and this and other made-up stuff. But that's a great promise there, isn't it? That I will be their God and they will return to me. I wanted you to see and remember here that God keeps his covenants. Three main covenants. I want you, I'm going to recall that you remember that. What we call the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? And it's in Genesis 12. Look on the screen. This is what God made a covenant to, with Abraham. A covenant with himself to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. God's going to keep that covenant. God's going to keep that promise. He just showed you right there in Jeremiah 24-7. They will return to me with their whole heart. The next covenant we see come on the scene is the Davidic covenant. The covenant he made with David. <clears throat> in 2 Samuel 7, look on the screen. He told David as David was about to die. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. See there? Singular. Descendant after you. Who will come forth from you. We know that this person comes from the direct line of Jesus. What I tell you a couple of weeks ago. We, can, we know through Matthew's genealogies there in Luke's, you know, that, that Jesus comes from the line of David. We can prove that. No Jew alive today could prove that. Everything was destroyed in 70 AD. They don't have, no. So if it's just Jewish guy everybody's talking about on the internet, you know, that's claiming to be the Messiah, they have, they have no proof that he's from the line of David. They can't prove that, not as far as I know. There may be people smarter than me that can tell you more, but uh, I didn't need to really hear any more. I know they can't prove that he's from the line of David, but Jesus Christ did prove it. Okay, the scriptures attest to that. That's why those, those verses are important. <laughs> you, we look at so-and-so begat so-and-so, right? And it looks boring. But when you hear that, you're like, oh, that's there for a reason. So he says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Was it 11 years? Three months? Like with Jeconiah or, you know, Zedekiah? No, forever. That's who he, who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. Jesus will fulfill the Davidic covenant that God made. And then, of course, we know the, the new covenant. Jesus tells us that he's given us a new covenant. We'll get to this in Jeremiah in a few chapters. But look on the screen with me at this one. Luke twenty two twenty. 20. In the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is what? The new covenant in my blood. I want you to be clear to understand. The, the, Jesus never made a covenant 
Um, when, when we get into eschatology, you heard me say all that when we were going through Daniel and 1 Thessalonians or whatever. The Antichrist is going to make a pact or a covenant with the Jewish people for seven years. As soon as the rapture happens, everything's going crazy. Antichrist rises to power. He makes a covenant with the Jewish people. <clears throat> Some people, what we call post-millennials, will tell you that that was, uh, no, that was Jesus making a covenant. No, in 70 A.D. No, Jesus never made a seven-year covenant with anybody. The only covenant that he made is what he said right there, a new covenant in what? My blood. Meaning for us as Christians, it's an eternal thing, right? And I'm going to say something about that. We don't keep the law of Moses to be right with God anymore. That was the old covenant. They had to keep the law of Moses, and they had to make the animal sacrifices. That's what they lived under. Jesus Christ came. And why did it have to be Jesus dying on a cross? You guys should, all of you regulars should have memorized this by now. I say it so much. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Those priests were wading in blood waist deep all the time. Morning, noon, morning, and in, in the midday, and the afternoon, all, all the time sacrificing, right? Constantly sacrificing. And they'd have to get up the next day and do what? Do it all over again. Because that was a temporary sacrifice. The only way we can be in heaven with God is we have to have an eternal sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats could never provide you an eternal sacrifice. It had to come from an eternal being. Jesus Christ is fully God in the flesh. He's the only eternal being. He's the only eternal God. He's always, he's, he's the Alpha and the Omega, right? In Revelation we see there's no beginning and there's no end to Jesus Christ. So it had to be him. That's why he is the only way. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can go to the Father. That's why, remember when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden and they put the cherubim over to block the garden? He, they could not enter back into, man, into God's presence. Why? Because they were sinners now. No sin can enter into heaven. How many of you have told a lie? Every hand in, go ahead and raise your hand, because you have. Every hand in here has told a lie. Because of that one lie, guess what? You can't be in God's presence. If you die right now, you cannot be in His presence. And let me make it even more biblical for you. Before you even told the lie, Romans 5 says, because of Adam's sin, you inherited the sin of Adam. So you could never be in God's presence. Jesus Christ had to die on a cross to make an eternal sacrifice so that when you put your faith in Him, when you abide in Christ, when you're forgiven of your sins by Jesus Christ, your sins are eternally forgiven. And I said eternally forgiven. We have a lot of brothers and sisters that think you can be eternally forgiven and then all of a sudden, whoop, you did too much. You're not eternally forgiven anymore. That's not biblical. You cannot lose your salvation once you get saved. Okay? Why? Because it's an eternal sacrifice. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. So we put our faith in Jesus alone for salvation. He is the only possible eternal sacrifice for sin. Look at the last three verses. But like the bad figs, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness, indeed, thus says the Lord, so I will abandon Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials. Zedekiah is the last king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And he, was a, he wasn't a real, he wasn't even in the line of David. He's, he's just a puppet king. Nebuchadnezzar put him on the throne. And the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land and the ones who dwell in the land of Egypt I will make them a terror and an evil for all the kingdoms of the earth as a repro reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse. In all places where I will scatter them, I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence upon them until they are destroyed from the land which I gave to them and their forefathers. These are the ones who decided to stay behind, I told you earlier, and not trust what God had said. They are the rotten figs, meaning there is no use for them at whatsoever ever they're done because they would not trust god he's cut them off they're rotten they're absolutely no good no no use for them whatsoever now in closing i want you to uh, i'm not going to read the whole thing to you but I, I got a few verses here i want you to hear and you can if you're taking notes you can go back and read deuteronomy 28 and starting in verse 15 deuteronomy 28 starting in verse 15 you will see all the terrible curses that God had promised 
thousands of years before to the Jewish people, if you don't keep my commandments, if you don't obey me, these are some of the curses that's going to come upon you. All right? So when, when he just told them there, these rotten figs, that if you don't go out and, and turn yourself in, you know, if you don't do what I've told you, then I'm going to make you a reproach and a terror. All these curses that God has promised are going to come upon them, and they did. And they did. And you'll see that as we go on. But I wanted you to hear a little bit of it. Look on the screen with me, and we'll wrap up. Deuteronomy 28, and I'm looking at verse 27. He says, The Lord will smite you with the boils of Egypt, and with tumors, and with the scab, and with the itch, from which you cannot be healed. Now, how many of you right there, just reading one of them, says, Okay, Lord, you got my attention. You got my attention, right? The whole scab and the itch thing, I, uh, and it cannot be healed. Here's some more. The Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. And you will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness and you will not prosper in your ways. But you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually with none to save you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man will violate her. You shall build a house, but you will not live in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you will not use its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will not eat of it. Your donkey shall be torn away from you and will not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, and you will have none to save you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, while your eyes look on and yearn for them continually. But there will be nothing you can do. A people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors and you will never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually. You shall be driven mad by the sight of what you see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and legs with sore boils from which you cannot be healed, from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall become a whore, a proverb and a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. Oh, I pray that he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says, right? Take warning. God shows us, though, and what I love about our God is even in this kind of judgment, he can still show mercy to those who will repent and obey. He's a gracious, he's a gracious merciful God. All you got to do is turn to him. Lord, forgive me my sins. Right? I believe with my heart, confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and you shall be saved. Anybody got any questions? Comments?